NIL, the transfer portal, head coaches, super contracts, and major conference realignment has the entire country debating whether or not these changes are good for college football. I've heard the arguments and know everybody's got their own point of view. But the reality is, things are going in a different direction, and if coaches around the country resist, they'll just end up getting left behind. Over the last two years, some schools have gone all in on leveraging NIL for recruiting. We've seen blue bloods like USC and LSU steal top tier head coaches to revive their struggling programs. And conferences even started adding random schools to boost their media rights deals to pay out over a billion dollars each year. I've got no doubt this next head coach can establish an identity for Nebraska football, but there's no arguing this game's changing, and a willingness to adjust to how it's played today is just as important as anything else on the resume. So today, I'm giving you the top five things I and hopefully Nebraska's next head coach have learned so far this football season that'll help him get off to a fast start in Lincoln. But what's up guys, I'm Connor Hayden, and this is Corn Crazed. If you're a fan of Nebraska or the Big Ten, or you just love college football, make sure you hit the subscribe button below so you don't miss any of the content I make. And if you want to help more people find this video, and if you want to support the channel, hit the like button now to help us get to 1,000. But now, let's get into it. Every morning, I wake up to a dozen messages about the latest rumors and about 50 tweets from random pages with absolutely zero credibility claiming that Nick Saban's plane flew over Lincoln or that Mickey Joseph's about to be announced as the head coach in the next 15 minutes. I promise you, if it comes from a random page on Twitter, it's fake news, and you don't need to send it to me. And if it's real news, it already got reported by Sean Callahan on his private membership site, and somebody on Twitter just stole it from him and claimed it as their own. After the meltdown we watched on Saturday, I'm almost certain Trev's not going with Mickey because his limited resume needed more Big Ten wins to help him land a major job like this one. But because I think it's going to be an outside hire, here are the two ways things can go. Number one, Trev makes a decision on a non-active head coach like Matt Rule, and Husker Online hints at it in the next two weeks once they've confirmed the deal's done. Probably won't get leaked until November 20th at the soonest. Number two, Trev chooses an active coach with a job somewhere else, and he waits to announce it on the Saturday after Nebraska plays Iowa. This one makes the most sense, and I wouldn't be surprised if we don't find out till then, even if it is a guy who doesn't have a job right now. My opinion on this whole thing is that Trev's narrowing down his list, and he's doing interviews with the top guys right now, so I'd be shocked if we heard anything was close to being finalized before the Wisconsin game. This weekend, Illinois lost to Michigan State, Purdue lost to Iowa, and Minnesota escaped Nebraska, who, without Casey Thompson, is the undisputed worst team in the Big Ten. I've said for the last few weeks that Purdue, Illinois, and Minnesota were all just okay, and I had so many comments from people trying to argue with me about that. These three all have two things in common. One, great game management and play calling. Two, a weak schedule since they play in the Big Ten West in 2022. There's not one team in this division who deserves to be ranked in the top 25 based off their resume so far. And this might be the worst the West has been since before Nebraska joined it. Outside of Michigan, Ohio State, and maybe Penn State, any team can beat another in this conference this year. And even though Nebraska couldn't do anything on offense these last two weeks, if they can get Casey back for Wisconsin and Iowa, they could still finish this year off strong. I'll have some type of Michigan preview video this week, and on Thursday evening, I'm back with the Social Club live stream to talk to College Football with Sam so he can give us his thoughts on this matchup, his Big Ten power rankings, and what he thinks about the coaching search. So if you want to check that out, make sure you're subscribed and you've got post notifications on so you don't miss any of those reminders. I'm about to get into the list about what I've learned so far this year. But before I do, I wanted to shout out everybody in our bro throw group who won money on Nebraska this weekend because I know there were a bunch of people in the group who rode that play. I saw Sheldon had some big wins and ended up plus 340 on the weekend after he won on Nebraska, Notre Dame, Michigan State, and Wisconsin. So if you need some winning plays, go check out what bets Sheldon's taken. The number one reason I bet on bro throw instead of some of these other sites is because they're not a sports book. So I save money on the big and over the course of the season, that adds up to be hundreds of dollars. If you want to win $20 on bro throw, you risk $20. 
If you want to win $20 on another site, you've got to risk $22. And if you want to get into our group and try this site out for yourself, just head to brothrow.com slash GBR. It's all free. And you'll be added to our corn craze community on the site so you can start betting on games with me and almost 500 other subscribers from the channel. They've been a great sponsor that helps me to make these videos every week and I've had a great time making bets on the site this past month. This season has been one of the most fun to watch in recent memory for a few reasons. One, the portal spread talent out. So teams like Kansas, Oregon, USC, and Texas are all way better than they were these past few years. Two, the dominant schools like Bama, Clemson, and OU all lost a lot of depth. So any team can lose now since there aren't as many five stars on the bench ready to play after a starter goes down. And three, the absurd NIL deals and the crazy money going out to coaches turn college football into a full-blown reality TV show, and there's always drama with players or coaches who are now basically part of professional sports teams. It's easy to soak it in and enjoy it as a fan, but if you're a coach right now, all this change is a nightmare to navigate because you got to adjust your staff's daily responsibilities, you got to work with boosters now more than you ever had to before, and the job's about more than just the X's and O's or recruiting your backyard. Some coaches are adjusting better than others, and guys like Lane Kiffin, Lincoln Riley, Deion Sanders, or even Brian Kelly have mastered the portal. They're using social media to their advantage, and as we've seen so far this season, they're all surpassing expectations and already on pace to crush their expected win totals. I'm not expecting Nebraska to steal a massive coach away from another blue blood the way USC or LSU did this past year, but I am hoping that Trev finds a guy who understands that if he doesn't adapt and learn how to win today, he doesn't have any chance of succeeding in the Big Ten. With all that said, let's get into the five things I've learned so far this season that Trev Alberts and his next head coach should be paying attention to. Number one, the right head coach can turn things around immediately. Lincoln Riley, Brian Kelly, Sonny Dykes, and Kalen DeBoer all took over programs that finished with losing records last season. SC and TCU control their own destiny for the playoff, and both LSU and Washington can still make it to their conference championship game or even a New Year's Six Bowl game. All four of these coaches inherited teams who lost three or more starters to the transfer portal, and they still found a way to get enough guys ready to win in year one. USC and LSU went out and stole two big names with massive contracts, but TCU and Washington just had to find guys who understood what it would take to win with what those schools could offer. I'm not expecting Nebraska's next coach to win more than six in his first season, but if this year's taught us anything, it's that with the right guy in charge, it's 100% possible. Number two, the importance of developing a good backup quarterback. The Casey Thompson-led Nebraska offense was about as efficient as you could expect given the O-line issues, but as soon as he went down, they couldn't move the ball. Casey's calm, his film study habits are as good as any player in the country, and even though he throws some wild passes, he gave the offense a chance to score on every single drive. Whether you're pro Chuba or you want to see Logan get more reps, the fact is neither of those guys are prepared to lead an offense that can perform anywhere close to what Casey was doing. And that's not their fault. The staff turnover hurt the QB room and Whipple's had less time to develop the backups. But Nebraska's not the only big name school who's lost their starter. They are, however, the only big name I've seen who hasn't prepared their depth. Kansas State lost to Adrian Martinez for multiple games, and backup Will Howard's thrown for six TDs and over 500 yards in two weeks. Texas had to play Hudson Card in five games this year, and he's completing almost 70% of his passes with a 6-1 to one TD to interception ratio, and he's 2-1 and one as a starter. Minnesota benched Tanner Morgan last week, and their backup brought him back down 10 to win that by 7. And Kansas backup Jason Bean's stats look almost identical to Jalen Daniels with 11 touchdowns and almost 1,000 yards passing in the last four games. These examples show us that whether you're coming off a two-win season, you're dealing with guys from the portal, or you're a team who runs the ball first, having a serviceable backup isn't just important. It's necessary if you want to win at the highest level. Number three, hiring the right staff is just as important as hiring the right head coach. Let's use Bama, Clemson, and Iowa as examples before we talk about what's been going on in Lincoln. When you're competing at a high level and finishing ranked in the top 5 or 10 every year, you're going to lose important parts of the staff to other schools that will give them bigger roles. 
Clemson and Bama look as bad as we've seen since the playoff era, and they have the same head coaches, the same highly rated recruits, and their schedules are just as manageable as they were before. I heard Josh Pate give a breakdown on his show last night about both those teams struggling to play at as high of a level as we're used to because of how much staff turnover they've been dealing with. What we see as fans is different from what actually happens behind the scenes and what happens at practice. Without the right assistance, the team can't perform to the level the head coach expects. Iowa's another example. Kirk Ferentz consistently feels an elite defense that's held back by average play on offense. The right coordinator would come in and make changes at quarterback, or at least develop the starter, and he'd adjust the play calling to score a few more points. Nebraska's been worse than all of them. Four years with the same staff and Frost never made a bowl game or fielded an elite offense or a dominant defense the entire time. Trev finally forced him to make a change, and now Brian Applewhite has a potential 1,000-yard back in year one. Mickey Josephs recruited better receivers than we've seen since 2018, and Bill Bush's special teams look 100 times better than what we've seen since Frost arrived. I saw a note from Sean Callahan that Mark Stoops' staff at Kentucky makes far more than any assistants at Nebraska ever have. So if money's what it's going to take to draw the right guys in, I hope Trev opens the wallet. Number four, the transfer portal wipes out the rebuilding years. Everybody remembers what Mel Tucker did at Michigan State last year. But who's the portal king today? Lane led his team to a 10-win season, but a rebuild was expected after they lost six starters on each side of the ball. Kiffin hit the portal harder than anybody else, and after landing the number two class in the nation, Ole Miss is 7-2 with the help of 12 guys who haven't even been on campus for an entire year. Lincoln Riley did the same thing at SC with 20 transfers, Brian Kelly at LSU with 16, and Chip Kelly at UCLA with 13. But Ole Miss working that magic after years of mediocrity in Oxford gives me hope that a good coach can make a similar move in Lincoln this offseason. Frost had the number 7 transfer class with 15 commits, and 12 of them are playing meaningful snaps. But a good portal haul doesn't mean much without the right culture and the right scheme. And number five, the two most important units on the field in the Big Ten are the offensive and the defensive lines. We knew this before, but this year, it's been the entire story. Nebraska still on both sides has been as good as we've seen in a while. But the lines on both sides have been such a mess, it's damn near impossible to compete with any decent team. Even Northwestern, who's the only team worse in the division than Nebraska, dominated at the line of scrimmage in Week 0, and they were able to win that game because of it. Without a line, you can't run the ball. Without a line, you can't pass the ball. And without a line, you can't keep your quarterback healthy. Iowa's offense and their quarterback are ranked in the bottom three nationally. But because they have a decent line, they were able to run the ball on Purdue and pull out their fifth win of the year. The same goes for almost everybody else in the Big Ten. None of these teams are great, but they're all more physical in the trenches, and it shows in every one of Nebraska's losses over the past few years. The O-line is the hardest unit to build up, and because of that, I find it hard to believe that any coach who comes in next year can win more than five or six out the gate. There aren't many coaches who've been able to execute everything on this list, so my hope is that whoever gets the job is watching the game change just like we are and can adapt his philosophy and his style accordingly. But I want to know what you think, so let me know in the comments below. Can Trev find a coach who's ready to change the culture and implement new ideas that Nebraska's never seen? Is the line as important as it seemed this year, or can a good coach work around the issues we've had with size and technique? And do you think the future backup quarterbacks on the roster now, or are we in for a massive portal haul come December? I'm back this week with a Michigan preview, but until next time, thank you for being here and I'll see you in the next one. Go Big Red.